Well, good evening and, and welcome to all as uh, we gather here on our first night of our annual parish mission. Uh, so we uh, welcome all here, particularly those who may be visiting from other uh, parishes or other, other Christian communities. Uh, welcome to you all this evening. And a special welcome to Father John O'Neill, who former associate pastor, now pastor of two parishes in Bartlesville, uh, uh, St. John before the Latin Gate, as well as St. James Parish. Uh, Father uh, John and I are also uh, in the same prayer group for priests, our Azu Karitas group, the Heart of Jesus. So, uh, very glad that he can be with us here this evening to share this message about the Holy Family, and the model of grace in a messy world, this being the year of grace. So, we gather here tonight in the name of Jesus, and our hearts will be open to be touched by that grace, this hope. So let us begin with a moment of prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask your blessing be upon us, that your Holy Spirit guide us, strengthen us, nourish us, that the grace that you pour out upon us in Jesus our Savior make us desire even more your love and desire that we become saints. In the session of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may your grace be upon us this night. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Brian. What happens in Jesu Caritas stays in Jesu Caritas. So I will not be saying any stories about Father Brian. Um, I have put the numbers on the uh, boards for the songs that we're going to be doing tonight. So if you want to get out your blue hymnal, even though they're not all blue, they're all blue. 1100, I believe, is the mass, uh, one of the, go the gospel for this last weekend. And so if you need to refer to that, because we will talk about that a little bit. I already talked about it. But uh, please join me in song. We're going to praise God a little bit to start. a hand clap. You did better than me on that. So. <clears throat> Sing a new song unto the Lord. Let your song be sung from mountains high. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Singing a Shout with gladness, dance for joy. Oh, come before the Lord and play for God on glad tambourines. 
And let your trumpet sound Sing a new song unto the Lord Let your song be sung from mountains high Sing a new song unto the Lord Singing Alleluia Rise, O children, from your sleep Your Savior now has come He has turned your sorrow to joy And filled your soul with song Sing a new song unto the Lord Let your song be sung from mountains high Sing a new song unto the Lord Singing Alleluia Glad my soul for I have seen The glory of the Lord The trumpet sounds, the dead shall be raised I know my Savior lives Sing a new song unto the Lord Let your song be sung from mountains high Sing a new song unto the Lord Singing Alleluia Singing Alleluia Singing Alleluia Thank you, Jesus. Y'all are doing a good job. Now, if you remember this weekend, the second reading... I think it was Corinthians, talked about we are all one body, but we are many parts. Do you remember that? We talked about that in the homily. So we're going to sing, we are many parts. We are many parts. We are all one body. And the gifts we have we are given to share may the spirit of love make us one indeed one the love that we share one our hope in despair one the cross that we bear god of all we look to you servants true let us be your love to all the world we are many parts we are all one body and the gift we have we were given to share may the spirit of love Make us one indeed, one the love that we share, one our hope in despair, one the cross that we bear. So my pain is pain for you, in your joy is my joy too, all is brought together in the Lord we are many parts we are all one body and the gifts we have we are given to share may the spirit of love make us one indeed one the love that we share one our hope in despair one the cross that we bear all you seekers great and small seek the greatest gift of all if you love then you will know the lord we are many to share may the spirit of love make
make us one indeed one the love that we share one our hope in despair one the cross that we bear have any of y'all given any thoughts to being a a part of the body of christ since saturday night or sunday and maybe where your part fits in somebody in the back raise their hand you know it's just like tonight we are many parts we're sitting in different places. Some of y'all maybe not be sitting in your normal Sunday seat because somebody else is sitting in it, right? Ooh, that gets us going, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's okay because it takes all of us. It takes all of us. And I had to come and we got help plugging in the guitar and setting up the microphones. I couldn't do it. I needed help. I had to borrow Rob's music. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it takes many parts. It takes all of us. Uh, I think it was Hillary Clinton. It takes a village. Well, it takes more than a village. It takes all of us. That's who we are. And we come tonight and we ask God, we ask Christ, we ask the Holy Family to model for us grace to be present in this moment, to receive, to open our eyes, open our hearts, open our very beings to receive. So this next song we're gonna sing is Open My Eyes, Lord. Open my heart, Lord. Open my ears. Let's be open to whatever God has for us this evening. Open my eyes, Lord. Help me to see face open my eyes Lord help me to see open my ears Lord help me to hear your voice open my ears Lord help me to hear First shall be last, and our eyes are open. We're here like never before, and we'll speak in new ways, and we'll see God's face in places we've never known. Open my heart, Lord. Help me to love like you. Open my heart, Lord, help me to love, and the first shall be last, and our eyes are open, we're here like never before, and we'll speak in new ways, and we'll see God's face in places we've never known. I live within you deep in your heart oh love I live within you rest now in me this last song we're gonna sing as we get started Oh, breathe on me, O oh, breath of God. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be with us. Let's invite angels to surround this building, surround all of this. Let's be present to what God has for us this evening. <clears throat> oh, oh, breathe on me, O oh, breath of God. Fill me with life anew That I may love the things you love And do what you would do Oh, breathe on me Oh, breath of God, uh -huh. 
until my heart is pure until my will is one with yours to do and to endure oh breathe on me oh breath of god my will to yours incline until this selfish part of me glows with your fire divine oh breathe on me oh breath of god so shall I'd live with you the perfect life of your eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. Thank you for all that you give us. Thank you for this moment where we come together to hear your voice to see your eyes, to receive your breath so that every breath we take is a breath you offer us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to start off with a book recommendation. I don't know if you've read this book or you've seen this book. Uh, all that I'm talking about is not in this book. But I've recommended it. We actually gave it out to our parishes this, this uh, year at Christmas. It's called Life is Messy. Has anybody read this book? Okay. Pick it up. Life is Messy. We're going to talk about messiness. Anybody here got a messy life? If you're all not raising your hands, you're lying to yourself. Uh, the, the, the theme... Is the Holy Family a model of grace in a messy world? And so, since we're talking about a model of grace, let's talk about grace for a minute. Does anybody know the definition of grace? Nobody? Okay, from the dictionary. I, I wrote it down so I would have it. Courteous goodwill. Courteous goodwill. Oh, that's a nice name. Yeah. St. Thomas Aquinas. A special gift from God. And another one in theological circles, and this is where we are in the Catholic Church, unmerited favor. You cannot do anything to get grace. You cannot earn grace. You can't because it's unmerited. And, and one of the forms that we understand grace is God's unconditional love for us. Unconditional. No conditions. Has anybody ever had unconditional love for somebody? It's tough, and we are not perfect in it. I would say, I, I don't have children or grandchildren. Don't take parenting advice from Father John, okay? But when you've seen that baby for the first time, somewhere in you is the understanding of unconditional love because that baby is a creation of mother and dad and God. And there's nothing but love that exudes from that baby. Would you agree, parents, grandparents? And, and grace, for me, I've, I've tried my whole life to earn grace. Anybody tried their whole life to earn grace? But we can't earn it because it's a gift. It's a gift. 
It's a gift. And as Aquinas said, it's a special gift from God. And so if it's a gift, as we're talking over these next two nights, don't hesitate to think about times when you have received grace and it's been something that you haven't earned. I mean, it could be very simple. I was thinking tonight as I was driving here, I was driving down the Broken Arrow, and I was doing about 60, 61, and at that point it was 55, and up behind me pulls a highway patrolman. He gave me grace. He didn't pull me over. It was unmerited. So I pulled over and let him by, and then he goes, and then somebody in front of me is a little slower, so I pulled back over, and then a Tulsa policeman pulls behind me. He gave me grace. I pulled over, let him by. I drove the speed limit the rest of the way here. Didn't want to test it, because three times is a charm, right? But it could be simple grace, or it could be something fantastic that is the grace that we see. But I want you to just, as we go, and if you're a note taker, you can take a note. If you want to punch something, text yourself, all that kind of stuff, don't hesitate, because we're talking about a model of grace. And where, and where that grace comes from is God, this special gift, unmerited favor, but how in the Holy Family they are models of that grace. So let's get to the messiness. That's what I love to talk about. Not really. So let's name some of the mess in the world. Anybody got something that's a mess? What? Divorce is a mess. What else is a mess? Abortion's a mess. Priorities is a mess. I didn't hear the one in the back. The media's a mess. Our government's a mess. The world is a mess. There's lots of things that are a mess, right? And, and we can take this from a world level, right? What's happening right now over in uh, Eastern Europe? Woo! Right? What's happening in the Middle East? Woo! What's happening in Asia? Woo! What's happening in D.C.? Woo! No. <laughs> right? The world is in a mess. The world is in a mess. And some of that mess directly affects us, and some of that mess doesn't. Part of the challenge of this mess is that the evil one loves a mess. Do you understand that? He loves a mess. Why? Because he can distract us. He can stir up a mess. And he can distract us from what God is calling us to do or who God is calling us to be. And somebody said the media is a mess. You know, please don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. How many of y'all watch news at least two hours a day? Don't raise your hand. How many of y'all are on social media at least an hour a day? Don't raise your hand. And I say don't raise your hand because that's not necessarily something to be proud of because that's exactly where the evil one is at, stirring up the mess. And it doesn't matter whether you walk Fox or CNBC, MSNBC, or CNN, or NPR, or PBS. It doesn't matter, because it's all a mess. Here's my challenge. Again, you didn't raise your hands. If you spend two hours a day watching the news, I challenge you to cut that in half and spend the other half reading Scripture. Your life will change, literally overnight. And if you only spend 20 minutes, cut it in half and spend the other 10 in Scripture. Part of our challenge is, as a people, in the mess, and where the, the, the evil one stirs it up, 
is he makes us think that that's more important than what's really important in our lives. Does that speak to anybody tonight? It's really easy. It's really easy. Facebook, Twitter, what's, you know, scroll it up, read for an hour, Google News, Yahoo. It's, how easy is it to do that, right? You got your computer in your pocket. Oh, I'm on a break at work. Oh, I'm waiting for my lunch. Oh, dinner isn't ready yet at home. I just got done with my chores. I wake up in the morning, you know, what am I supposed to think today? I got to go to my favorite website and they tell me what I'm supposed to think, right? Is that easy? Are we in a habit of it? I'm preaching to myself too. Why? Because we all do. I had my best Lent last Lent ever. And I'm an old guy. I've had lots of Lents. I gave up technology. No internet, no Facebook, no TV, no movies, no nothing. Now, I had to keep text and email for my job because people text me and people email me. Everything else was off limits. No eBay, no Craigslist, nothing, nothing. Do you know that I read in Lent? I read more books during Lent, and they were all spiritual books, than I have in the 10 years previous. Because I took my mind off the junk and I said, okay, God, what are we going to fill this time with? Because I'm going to go crazy if I don't have my phone. But I took my eyes off the mess. And I put my eyes on God. Now, I'm not holier than thou. I lucked into it. Because somebody else had talked about uh, this thing called, anybody heard of Exodus 90? Exodus 90 is a thing you go through and, and uh, uh, you, you're no media and cold showers and there's all this different kind of stuff you do. I had no interest in doing all that stuff, let me tell you. Cold showers and me are not friends. I did enough of those when I did on, on youth mission trips, okay? But that thing about technology kind of interests me. And so I just put away my phone. Now, I'm not condemning anyone here for what you're doing. I'm asking you to reflect on it yourself and decide if that's something God may be calling you to or something different. Maybe there's something else that, uh, that takes your time up. You know, I don't know. There, there's so many different opportunities. We live in such a beautiful time, don't we? God is so good to us. Is everybody here blessed to the Lord? Everybody here slept in a house last night? Had heat or air? Had a bed? Pillow? Maybe a blanket or two if you needed them? AC if you needed it, right? We're so blessed. We're so blessed. Somebody sent me an email, and this was the, one of the first emails I've read in a long time, and it said 7.8 billion people in the world, and then it went down and did all these percentages. I should have printed it out. One thing was, it, it said that in America, most of the people in America, you and I, everybody that's here, I would say, would fit into this, are like in the top 2.5% of the world in our lifestyles and how we live. Because we have electricity, we have running water. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. And that's a beautiful thing. God has given us that grace, right? We're born in this country. Some of us have moved to this country. We're born to the families we're born in. Are our families a mess? Anybody here got a messy family? Oh, whoo, we didn't, nobody said family's a mess. It's a mess. But the world is a mess. I, I, I listed a few things. I want to make sure we got them all. Ooh. Is work a mess? Hmm? Are relationships a mess? 
in a way, is what's happening even in the Christian world a mess? The infighting between even within Catholic Church or the Catholic Church and others or other churches in the Catholic Church. Is it a mess? It's an unbelievable mess. Now, there is hope tonight, okay? Please. <laughs> it's not all bad. Because there's an answer. And we know the answer. We talked about it this weekend. The one who went to the cross for us. He loves us. Right? He loves us. But we still got to deal with a mess. Anybody here got to deal with a mess? Okay, so now I want to talk just a moment about the mess 2,000 years ago and see if this sounds familiar. The government was uh, using its power sometimes in ways that wasn't good for the whole. The Romans were running everything, weren't they? And, and if it wasn't the Roman way, out the door. Does that sound familiar? People who were expecting the Savior seemed to be oppressed by everybody else because what's this deal with the Savior? You know, I think about back 2,000 years ago and, and the conversation around the water cooler, well, they didn't have water coolers, maybe around the well, was, have you heard any more about the Savior? Hey, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Have you, you know, when this king takes over, the Romans are going to get kicked out of here. Aren't you excited about that? And that's what they were saying to each other. Everybody, the chosen people, we're waiting for a Savior. And, and it's about time. All of the prophecies have said it's about time for it to happen. But yet it wasn't happening. And that was causing a lot of strife, even within the Jewish people. Wow. Wow. Mary and Joseph, specifically. David, or uh, Joseph, was a descendant of David the king. Yet he was not living a royal lifestyle, was he? He was just another carpenter. Another guy trying to make a living. That was kind of a mess. Getting closer to the Holy Family. Mary has a vision, or not a vision, Mary meets the angel, Angel Gabriel. This is the same angel that six months before had come to Zechariah and talked to Zechariah about him going to be a father and his wife bearing a son and he lost his voice couldn't speak anymore is that a mess you think that's a mess anybody here would be a challenge if you lost your voice couldn't speak some of y'all may be thinking if the person next to me lost their voice it would be nice <laughs> that's part of that messy family thing Mary met this angel and the angel said, you're to be the mother of God. Wow. And, and she says, how? I haven't had relations with a man. How? But she said yes, didn't she? We'll talk more about that later. Now we have a teenager who's pregnant without being married. Ooh. Does that sound familiar to these days and times? She goes, runs off. What does she do? She runs off to her aunt, her cousin, right? Elizabeth's her cousin. Runs to her cousin. You know, I don't remember this. But I know around different times, 
in the olden days, when somebody was pregnant out of wedlock, they sent them off to grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle in a different town, didn't they? Doesn't that, doesn't that sound familiar to this story? Has anybody here seen the movie The Nativity Story? It's a story about Mary and her... I recommend it as a, as a movie. I, I just happened on it one time and watched it, and it's fabulous because it talks about the struggles that Mary went through, the scandal of this teenager who went off and was there for three or four months with Elizabeth till John was born, then came back to her village pregnant. That's the first anybody knew about it. Joseph, who was betrothed to her, sees her pregnant. He didn't know anything about it. Ooh, that's a mess. The scandal of the family. What's going on here? The census that was called when Mary was pregnant and they had to go. And then there's no room at the inn. And then, and then they had to flee to Egypt. Is that a mess? What would that look like today? We've talked about some, you know, a young girl who's pregnant. Today, part of the challenge is, right, keeping them from having an abortion, loving them so they choose life, right? Because abortion is so readily available. The scandal of that, it's such a mess it's not even much of a scandal anymore, is it? It's kind of accepted. In fact, one of the challenges is, in, in the world right now, is there are a lot of grandparents that are raising their grandkids because the kids aren't able to take care of them. And so grandparents who should be at their retirement time are working longer and having to do that. When I worked at Catholic Charities, that was something that happened all the time. Grandparents come in, I now have two kids, and I don't know what to do. How do I get help? I'm on a fixed income. That's a mess. Homelessness, it's a mess. Homelessness everywhere. I, I remember going to Colorado uh, about a year and a half ago now, Durango, Colorado. And Durango, has anybody ever been to Durango? It's a beautiful city. It gets cold in the winter there. It's, you know, and, and the, their homeless population has just exploded there. And I happened to just drive down this one road, going to a, I was going to visit a certain park. And on the way to the park, I saw off to my right, I saw kind of uh, some people there. And I asked somebody at the park, I said, I saw, I saw this, you know, it looked like there was some tarps put in some trees. I said, oh yeah, that's where the homeless people live. And so when I went back and I looked, and there were a lot of people there, and there were tarps up that hill all over. People lived in Durango, Colorado. That's not even New York City or Los Angeles. Go to downtown Tulsa. We have a, we have a, a whole task force that is coming together in Bartlesville to deal with the homeless issue, to see how we can help. It's unbelievable. It's a mess. It's a mess. How can we find hope in the mess? Do you feel a little hopeless right now? Do you feel a little down? I didn't mean to do that, but it's kind of where it's going, isn't it? Because it is a mess. Now, I want you to just think for a moment in your own life. What's the mess in your own life? We've been talking about all this stuff kind of out here. I want you to think about if, if there's a situation in your own life. You know, maybe someone is ill. Maybe someone here is ill. Visiting with someone who lost a parent just in the last few days. We've, we've had uh, some parishioners that have been hit by COVID recently. Had, had two of our 50 plus year parishioners pass away just in the last two days. 
There's all kinds of messes. Do you have, do you have a, a relative that's kind of estranged? Or maybe you're the one that's estranged from your relatives. Or somebody that nobody talks about because they're kind of out there. Or maybe you've got somebody, I've got somebody in my family who's dealing with mental health issues. That's a mess. Mental health is a mess. Especially when somebody doesn't recognize they have mental health issues and the challenges with that. It's a mess. Can there be any hope? Yes. Absolutely. So what I want to do now, I want to kind of turn the corner, if we might, for the rest of this evening. I want to visit about one of the messes in the Holy Family's life and kind of just ponder what that might look like for you and I. Is it okay if we do that? Let me find in the scripture, because I want to read the story. Everything I do, all the references I'm doing is Luke 1 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 2, if you ever want to go find it, so it's all in there. I should have brought my glasses. Here we go. I'm going to read Luke 2, 41. That's where I'm going to begin. This is the, for you, this is the fifth joyful mystery. Mary and Joseph find Jesus in the temple. Each year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. Is that a mess? Ooh. Let's think about that for a moment. What would it be like if you couldn't find one of your kids for three days? you that have kids. What emotions would you have? Anxiety, right? Worry. Mary's mad at Joseph. Joseph's mad at Mary. You should have been keeping track of him. He's the son of God. He can take care of himself. No, no, no. He's only 12. Every negative emotion you can imagine. And, and we're talking three days. Three days. Anybody here lost your kid in Walmart or something for two minutes? You know an inkling of it, don't you? Look out the backyard or, or again, I'm not a parent, but... Everything's really quiet upstairs. Uh oh, it starts there too, right? Something's going on. Everything negative. What a terrible moment. Now, now, if you're like me, when we think of the Holy Family, don't we usually see this idyllic picture of Joseph with his halo and Mary with her halo? holding this baby with its halo. Oh, life is beautiful. Everything's perfect. Is that how you think of the Holy Family? That's how I think of the Holy Family. Listen, he was a carpenter. He worked a job. He worked for a living. They weren't royalty. There's a scene in uh, The Passion of the Christ. Anybody seen that movie, Mel Gibson's movie? It's a beautiful movie. And one of my favorite scenes is one of those flashback scenes. It's when Jesus is carrying his cross, and he falls to the ground with the cross. And Mary sees him falling, 
And there's this flashback in Mary's head of Jesus running down some stairs as a little boy, maybe five or six or seven years old, and falling and scraping his knee. And in that moment, Mary's, oh my gosh, I have to go save him. I have to go help him. Sometimes we need to, to, to imagine, to allow our thoughts to be open to not everything was perfect for the Holy Family because they were a family. They were a family. Jesus was fully human. So he was probably a snotty-nosed 12-year-old kid at some times to Mary and Joseph, I would think. Now you're going, oh, 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 Father John, you're blaspheming. I don't think so. Because it says he became man so that he would know what we went through. It didn't say, it said many times in scriptures. In fact, one of, the, one of the lines in here was, Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. Right? He wasn't the man ready to go to the cross when he was born. He had to live his life and go through the mess and go through the experiences to gain the ability that when time came, he could go to the cross. My understanding of Jesus' most human moment is in the Garden of Gethsemane when his humanity is at its peak for me, he says, Lord, I can't handle it. It's the next line, as a human, that gives me hope. But not my will, your will be done. He says, take this cup from me, please. I can't handle it. But no, I'm going to do your will. That's very human. When, when he said that, when I realize that, when I pray over that, I realize that there's hope for me because there's a lot of things in my life I can't handle. I've got to have God handle it for me. One of my new little catchphrases for me, and it, it is so apropos. How are you doing, Father John? I'm doing good. Busier than I can handle, but that's why there's a God. Because he handles what I can't. I think it was Pope Pius VI, or Pope Paul, one of them, who said at night, before he'd go to bed, he'd say his prayers, and he'd say, okay, God, I'm going to sleep. The world is yours. There's some wisdom in that. But imagine this moment, three days you're searching for your son and all the challenges that are going on, all the emotions. What if something's happened to him? What if we don't find him? You know, one day's tough, two day, three days, wow. That, these days, that, you know, 24 hours you get an Amber Alert these days, right? They didn't have Amber Alerts back then. They couldn't send an all-text message to every one of their, on their contact list to let them know the look, right? It's a different time. Let's continue on. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. What do you think their emotions were then? Relief. Right? Joy. Right? Happiness. What, it would be almost um, the, the difference in the emotion in those in that 10 seconds of seeing your son, oh, it would be so different, wouldn't it? I've gone from this anger, fear, anxiety, all this stuff, to joy, happiness, pleasantness, 
relief. <sighs> I've got my son back again. I've got my life back again. That, that which you entrusted me, God, I have back again. Wow. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, attitude added, this is not in scripture. Son, why have you done this to us? <laughs> Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Let's bring it to modern times. You've been playing those video games all day. So? Right? When are you going to take out the trash? I'll get it. Here's the, here's the bad one. I, some kids are here. When are you going to clean your room? Do you get that one? Every kid gets that one. I got that one. Right? Let's finish it out. But they did not understand what he said to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. So let's now unpack some of the grace. I think one of the graces that the Holy Family models for us here, and I think it's an important grace that we need to pay attention to, is the honest exchange between Mary and Jesus. I said my attitude was added, right? That wasn't in there. I can't imagine someone, I can imagine it. I've seen it. You've seen it. In the grocery store where a kid gets a candy bar or something, right? It happens. People are on edge. Life's messy, isn't it? It's maybe happened to you, right? Life's messy. This kid has been hounding me the whole time. He's like the thorn in my side, right? He's a sharp stick poking at me. All the time we're in the grocery store, you know? And finally, it's, oh! That's not what this looked like, I don't think. It's Mary talking to her son honestly. Jesus, why did you do this? Didn't you think we would be anxious? Didn't you think we would be worried? we've been searching for you for three days. Didn't you even care? Didn't you know that we would be? Is that very honest of Mary? Absolutely. And then here's a 12-year-old boy. Very honest. Why were you looking for me? I was right here the whole time. It's where I'm supposed to be. Right? Right? But then we, we attach it to Jesus because he's realizing his gifts and his abilities and what God has given him and what he's supposed to do with that. And he says, well, we were here in the temple and it's my father's house and, and I've got work to do. I better get started. This is what God has for me. Don't you understand that? An honest exchange between a mother and a son. Could be a daughter and a mother. Could be a daughter and a, a, a father. Could be two siblings. Could be an employer and an employee. An honest exchange. There's grace in an honest communication 
I think that's one of the challenges that we have in the mess of the world, is we don't have honest communication. We have agenda-based communication. My agenda, your agenda, if they don't match, we conflict. That's a huge mess. I think there's a grace. God can grace honesty. God can grace someone who's willing to be open and in a way expose who they are to the other. Allowing themselves to have an intimate exchange with somebody who may not believe the same way we do. Who may not understand the same way we are. I believe that's a model of grace. Open and honest communication. And maybe right now in this moment, you're even thinking about, yeah, man, I messed up yesterday. Or I got this, you know, last week. Oh. Or, you know, my so-and-so is just, we're always on each other's back and we're always in conflict. There's got to be a better way. Well, Maybe praying to God for the grace to be able to have an open and honest conversation with somebody that you need to have an open and honest conversation with. You know, I'm, I'm not a parent. Don't take parenting and my advice from me. But when I was at Catholic Charities, I worked with 4,000 volunteers, so I learned how to work with people and with personalities. And one of the things I figured out is when you want to communicate to someone honestly and openly, don't do it when emotions are charged. Because if you do it when emotions are charged, who knows where it's going to go? I just throw that out there. That's a bonus for tonight. <laughs> Can you see how that's a grace? Open and honest communication. Here's another one. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. Obedience. This is not just a son to a parent or a daughter to a parent. That's important. Because parents, you've been farther down the track than your kids, right? Grandparents, you've been farther down the track than your grandkids. And grandparents, you've been farther down the track than your kids and your grandparents. And there's something to be said about obedience. But there's also something to be said about mutual respect and mutual dignity. This is not necessarily holy family, but it's the grace that comes. There's a place in Scripture where it talks about love and it does all these things. Love is this and love is this and love is this. And if you don't have this and do this and do this and do this and you don't have love, right? It's a clashing symbol. There's something about obedience in love. It says, uh, you know, wives, this is a terrible paraphrase. Wives, submit to your husband, right? That's good if you've got a husband worth submitting to. What if he's not? Right? Here you go. Guys, you ready? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. We all, all the guys love that S word, submission, right? Until you understand the other side of that coin. But that is, that is the grace that comes from having open, honest communication. Having an understanding that I must respect just like they must respect. We must create an attitude of respect. And that's where obedience comes from. Obedience to your boss at work. I remember when I was in the manufacturing world, I was the operations manager. And, and, and my boss knew more about manufacturing than I did. And so when he said, you know, this is how it goes. This, so 
I'm just going to put in this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then the product comes out and it works. Sounded good to me. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And some of my people on the line didn't understand that. They thought it should be A, B, C, D, G, H, E, F, and then it comes out the line. No, 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 no. As long as you're obedient and you know how it does, it's not your fault. But when you start stepping out of that and saying, I'm going to do a new way, and then the machine breaks, Woo! right? You should have done it this way. Should have done it this way. I remember one speaker talking about husbands and wives and this, you know, this, the, uh, he, he was... He was very articulate. I hope I give him uh, honor in this. He says, why would we want to take wives off the pedestals we have them on? And then he said, and then he said, his wife said, that's true, but I don't want to be up on the pedestal. I want to be just low enough so when God takes a swing, he hits him first. There's something about this relationship that's give and take, isn't there? It's respect. And I think the Holy Family, in, th in this particular case, Jesus, as the Son of God, knowing that he's got to do his Father's work, is obedient to Mary and Joseph and goes back to Nazareth. It's not his time. In fact, at the wedding at Cana, he even told his mom it wasn't his time, wasn't it? He must have grown a little bit. He was about 30 years old, so that was about, what, 18 years later. It was still not his time, but it ended up being his time then. What else can we learn? Oh, Jesus grew. Let me find that again. I, I turned the page and lost it. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. So he grew. Do you and I need to continue to grow? Do we need to be open for God's grace to come in? That's why you're here tonight, right? So I, I, I think there's more. I think God has something more for me. This is a place where you get it, at the church. It's not the only place, but it's one of the places. Scripture, I talked about reading Scripture. What if you read Scripture more than you read now? Would you know more about Scripture next year than you do now? Would you, would you know more about Jesus' love for you if you studied how he loved you next year than you do now? And the last grace, and I think... This is, this is one of the most important in the context of a messy world and God's love for us. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Many times it talks about, Mary talks about, or, or the scripture talks about Mary and says, she pondered this. She, she saw this event and kept it in her heart and reflected on it. I believe that one of the challenges that we have in our world, because there's so much messiness going on, because there's so much distraction going on, that we've lost the understanding of stopping, taking a breath, and reflecting on what's going on. Reflecting on what's happened. Re reflecting on, wow, this is really beautiful. A few years ago, I opened a Facebook ac account and started a Facebook page. And there's lots of stuff on Facebook, okay? And some of it's good and some of it's uh, junk, okay? But I... I just, by chance, one morning was out walking and saw this beautiful sunrise. And I took a picture of the sunrise. 
and I put it on Facebook. And I said, wow, look at God's beauty. Just beautiful. A few days later, walking, another sunrise. And I thought, you know, this is a way to share my reflection, my pondering God's beauty with the world by just putting a picture. I've put thousands of pictures out there. Is anybody, friends on Facebook, do you see my pictures? That's all I do. I don't, no political stuff. Every once in a while I'll put, you know, something. I, I, I put on my Facebook I was coming here, you know, a couple of, I put my Lego nativity scene that I put together. I put the picture of that on there. Uh, you, <laughs> I, that's one of my uh, reflecting moments is when I'm building with my Legos. But I think Mary as a model of understanding how God's grace is working, sometimes in small ways or long way or big ways, is a model that we need to start focusing more on in our life. Taking a moment, taking five minutes. It doesn't take three hours to reflect on something. In seminary, one of the things we did is learn about our ministry assignments. I, was a, I had a ministry assignment where I went to the prisons. And there was a specific prison, a medium security prison that I went to. And I was a, 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 a kind of a counselor. I wasn't really giving counseling because I'm not a counselor. But people would come in and talk about faith stuff. Actually, they talk about anything. To have somebody new to talk to, because, you know, who's this guy? You know, I got my collar on. I'm not a priest, but I'm there. And, and after we had those experiences, we would all come back together, and then we would pause, and we would reflect on what we just experienced. And, and, and what, where was God working in that? Where were you growing? Where did you maybe stumble? And, and what might you learn for the next time? Or what you might share with someone else they might share with you that you might learn from or they might learn from you. And then I, I, I worked at the hospital in, in what's called clinical pastoral education. I was a chaplain at Hillcrest Hospital for a summer. And I worked about 50 hours a week just visiting rooms. I was in the burn unit and renal care and uh, was blessed, honored to be in the room quite a few times when people were passing with family members, uh, was there when seeing the miracle of, of, of medicine work and help bring people back to health that were in terrible places. Every week, all of us chaplains get together and we reflect what's going on. How's it being? How's life? Where are you learning from? Where are you seeing God working? Where, where could you do better? Where did you stumble? Where was God's grace? Father Brian and me in the Jesu Caritas group, that's one of the things we talk about is, how's life? What's going on? And we've been, I've been a priest five and a half years, and I've been going to this for about four and a half of those. And it's been such a blessing for me to, with brother priest to sit down and reflect. Every time I go on a retreat, Part of my time on a retreat is reflecting. Are you seeing a pattern? We should reflect. We should ponder. And so I want us to take from this night this scenario. Here's Jesus away from his parents for three days. And the worst anxiety you can imagine his parents have. And they're searching for Jesus. And they don't know where to find Jesus. And everything seems to be going wrong. And they're butting their heads against finding an answer to the challenge. And maybe it mirrors what's happened in your life. And then they find Jesus in the temple doing the Father's work. 
Maybe that's a message to us. When life is getting messy, when there's something going on that I'm, I'm, I'm up against the wall or I'm, I'm challenged or just the, the distractions are too much, it could be anything. Maybe we need to stop and go look for Jesus and then allow him to do the Lord's work in our hearts, in our lives. Maybe we need some healing. Maybe we need some comfort. Absolutely, we need his grace. That unmerited favor, that special gift from God that can feed us in that moment. Maybe that's what God has had you here for. Maybe those who are joining us online, maybe that's what you're here to hear is that I've got this mess in my life or these messes and I don't know what to do. Well, let's look to the Holy Family. Let's go looking for Jesus. Let's see if we can find him. Maybe even take that decade of the rosary, the fifth joyful mystery. Get down on your knees and pray. I believe in God, our Father, Three Hail Marys, a glory be. And then the fifth, glory, the fifth joyful mystery, Mary and Joseph find Jesus in the temple, and you pray that. And while you're praying it, go, okay, I'm looking for Jesus. Maybe you don't have time to do that because you gotta go in your boss's office or you're getting ready to call somebody on the phone. So maybe you just pray one Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, help me find Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus in this situation. And then when that situation, not when it's done, but after this interaction or whatever's happened, then to stop and ponder in your heart, where was God's grace in that? Maybe it was just in the fact that you stopped and took a breath. Because if you're like me, when a mess comes, usually I'm in full tilt charge mode, right? And if I run into, I'm ready to fight. Maybe, I, okay, I just need to take a breath. Hail Mary, full of grace. Y'all heard the memorari, the prayer? I, should, I gotta memorize it someday. The line in it that impresses me, never has anyone gone to Our Lady and she not helped. Never. Never. I believe that. I believe that. And part of the reason I believe that that, that, that hope has come to us is because Mary has been through the mess. Joseph has been through the mess. Jesus has been through the mess. The Holy Family has been through the mess. Maybe not the same mess, but it's a mess nonetheless. And they chose to look for Jesus. They chose to seek God's help. Let that be a model for us. Let's take out our blue hymnals and let's sing that last song, 658. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you.
it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. with you. Let us pray. This is a prayer for times of messiness. Prince of Peace, I find myself unable to cope with life sometimes. Instead of feeling grateful, I feel bogged down by the responsibilities of all that you have given me. I want to live out your love, but I find myself consumed with frustration, jealousy, or worry. I want to go closer to you, but in practice, I am too tired or bored or busy. Circumstances will rarely be ideal, I know that. But I also know that the only thing that makes life worthwhile is living it with you. Show me how to pray when things aren't perfect. Show me how to put aside all of the weights and sins and emotions that tangle me up and demonstrate to me daily the reality that if I spend time with you through your mercy and grace, things will be better. I will be better. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. God forever and ever. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace. Thanks be to God. It's been a blessing to be with you tonight. Tomorrow night we continue, 7 o'clock. There's more grace. There's more hope. It's still a mess, isn't it? God bless you all. I think there's, oh, there's some goodies out in the, in the, in the foyer or so. Oh, we do have cookies. We have cookies. Left no, let no. Okay.